I grew up in uh, Mumbai, in India. Uh, it was a city that I think when I look back retrospectively, really formed my perspectives on architecture and the city. And I got really interested even as a child in the idea of change and what change meant because I would go back to the places I grew up in for a few years and notice how the built environment had transformed. It also prepared me to study architecture. Uh, and I think I got interested in architecture just because of this kind of registering of the transformations uh, in the built environment. And then I went on to study architecture and extended that course of study uh, into looking at urban design and obtained a master's uh, in urban design, which I did at, at Harvard University in the US, which was uh, the first time I traveled uh, outside the country uh, and uh, was educated about the environment from a completely different cultural perspective. Uh, uh, we, you know, it was, it was really interesting and important because it actually prepared me to go back and confront the environment I grew up in and that I was familiar with. Uh, and that relocation was actually shocking because everything I had studied about how one can make architecture or urban design instrumental uh, in molding the built environment was challenged by my practicing in Mumbai and going back and situating myself in a city where every time I blinked, what I saw in front of me had changed. It was a city in motion. It was a city with uh, incredible densities. It was a city where uh, different worlds kind of coexist and coexisted in space in very close proximity. And I think that experience of the city confronting uh, these instruments uh, which I was sort of uh, equipped with as a professional, were completely challenged. You know, what, what makes uh, cities in Asia, South Asia, and in, in India particularly, say, different from cities in the West? And I would argue that uh, cities in the West are much more, uh, as physical plants, stable entities. Architecture is almost the single most important instrument by which these cities are organized. In contrast, uh, the Indian city, and I think by extension, the South Asian city, uh, architecture is definitely not the central spectacle of the city or the instrument by which the city is made and organized. It's people, the way they occupy space. Uh, they are counter spectacles. Festivals, for example, become the spectacle of the city, and these happen periodically. In the city of Mumbai, I think the most important one is the Ganesh Chaturthi, which is the immersion after 10 days of worship of the god Ganesh, which is the elephant god, and processions that entail millions of people uh, chant and they sort of weave them way, their way through uh, the city to immerse the clay idol of the god uh, at the end of this sort of 10 days of worship. Uh, and with that, uh, as that clay idol dissolves in the water of the bay where it's immersed, any memory of that spectacle kind of disappears. So these spectacles are not encoded in architecture. They don't even leave a trace. They disappear. They're ephemeral. I call this the kinetic city. It's, it's not the static city. It's the kinetic city. It's a city that is characterized by continuous motion, uh, by change, by landscapes reorganizing themselves. Uh, really, uh, the, the image of the city comes from the kind of associations people have with particular space, again, on a temporal scale. So, you know, it's a landscape of people jostling around. It's a landscape of changing uh, smells. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a landscape which is full of sound. Uh, it's dynamic. Uh, uh, it's ever-changing. Um, the temporal scale becomes critical in kind of registering even your understanding of the city as you kind of navigate through it. Through a particular lens, it might look like complete chaos, but there are embedded, implicit rules in it. You could say there is a particular culture that makes the city. And this is a very specific culture, which is which in cities like Mumbai would be quite different from, say, other cities in South Asia. You know, how do you then kind of discern what might be the culture of a place and what is the role that even culture might play? Because culture is made 
and remade every day because they're implicit rules. And, uh, and these change. The culture of a place changes and transforms with every generation. It's like identity. These are not found definitions, but these are constructed definitions. And so by extension, when we look at cities, it's, I think, critical to ask the question uh, uh, about infrastructure. Uh, because the two are kind of linked. And I think uh, for me, uh, the, something that's really interesting and not been paid enough attention is the notion of cultural infrastructure. Because if you just took the notion of infrastructure, which is really the instrument by which we relate to each other in any society, and it's the instrument by which actually cities are made. Uh, they're made not only in the way they operate as physical entities, but they're also made in the way that through the instrument of infrastructure, people relate to each other. Now, infrastructure, if you nuance it in its understanding, you can break it into physical infrastructure, which would be the road, the pipes that take water uh, through the system or, th or through any urban system, etc., the power grid. But you also have social infrastructure, which is schools and clinics and hospitals and universities and uh, perhaps markets are where there's a kind of blur between the physical and the social. But you know, there's also an important category which is cultural infrastructure, uh, which is infrastructure that allows you to make these kinds of implicit rules uh, that exist in societies. And one could argue that this could also be institutionalized because for culture to work and the kind of underpinning kind of foundation for culture is the trust that we begin to develop between us as human beings in any societies. And it's through that trust that we actually construct these implicit rules and how they shift, how they modify, how they morph uh, is actually a consensus that we build as human beings in any society. The notion of cultural infrastructure, in my view, becomes critical. You can institutionalize it or not, but cultural infrastructure exists. Now, the forms of this cult cultural infrastructure can differ. It can sometimes be intangible, ephemeral. It can be how people organize themselves ritualistically in a procession that weaves through the city. It disrupts physically the normality of particular neighborhoods. It engages people from different parts of the city in that conversation. Sometimes they're prepared for it, sometimes they're not. That is also a form of cultural infrastructure. And at the other end of, the, of that spectrum are the more formal, the more physical forms uh, which might be concert halls or which might be you know, art galleries or which might be uh, you know, physical plants that are also necessary. But I, I, I think part of the problem in the way we understand cultural infrastructure is we think of it in singular dimensions and we always equate it with a physical plant. And I think this is a notion we have to deconstruct if we want to productively uh, deploy uh, the construction of culture uh, in productive ways, but it also if you want to imagine uh, the idea of cultural infrastructure uh, as being critical uh, to how we imagine infrastructure generally uh, in our cities and infrastructure as that critical instrument by which we relate, through which we relate to each other. The way I would explain the kinetic city uh, is first in a simple binary, which is the static city and the kinetic city. Uh, the static city being one where architecture is the central instrument and spectacle by which the city is organized, and the kinetic city, which is about the movement of people in space, right? The life worlds that occupy, uh, you know, the instrument of the city, in a sense. But I think uh, I would argue that really the kinetic city, as I would like to propose it as a productive notion for us to uh, to employ in thinking about cities productively would be a city which is characterized by the notion of elasticity, by the idea of incrementalism, how things are done in increments, so therefore they are nimble and they allow uh, flexibility, uh, and a city that uh, is about appropriation, reappropriation, you know, disappropriation or whatever sort of adjectives you might want to use or verbs you might want to use to describe this process, which is actually a construct 
uh, that is about the idea of uh, dissolving or blurring uh, the, the usual binaries. A, a city where the kind of clear divisions uh, by which we normally uh, explain and understand cities and by extension the kind of institutions that occupy these cities. So for example, uh, where the rich live and where the poor live, or, or what the private sector does and what the public sector does, uh, what's private space and what's public space. Uh, you know, we have sharpened just in the way uh, the jargon, uh, the theoretical constructs uh, that have informed the way we've imagined cities. So our understanding of cities has always been defined by uh, understanding them through binaries. And while binaries are a very useful way to understand and organize the world around us, they're not productive in that they create forms of polarization and therefore they limit how we can imagine the cities. And, and so for me, the notion of the kinetic city is one where in urban space, there's a kind of dissolution or a, a dissolving uh, of these binaries. And this is across a whole spectrum of things. Uh, it's across um, you know, the question of celebration and cultural production. Uh, so the festivals become a, a great way that this happens. And uh, you, can, you can talk about how public space is used on a temporal scale and occupied, how a city's margins can be expanded in ways uh, that, sim uh, that, that a space can be attributed to many different functions. Uh, our, our ideas of zoning, for example, are ones that reinforce the notion of binaries, that this is a zone for work, that's a zone for living, that's a zone for recreation. But actually this can all happen in the same space if space is defined appropriately. And an example I love giving in Mumbai, for example, are, are these incredible cricket fields that we have in the city. Uh, you know, and as I half jokingly say, uh, you know, these are sacred spaces uh, because you know, cricket is considered to be a sacred sport. A, sport. Uh, a wonderful uh, uh, Indian game that the British invented. Uh, and these cricket fields, uh, you know, in the evenings get transformed uh, as venues for weddings, for the great big Indian weddings. Uh, and, uh, you know, these are erected out of beautiful, uh, you know, fabric and bamboo, which is assembled in five hours and disassembled at the end of the wedding before dawn so that the cricketers can occupy this space again. And for me, that is an example of uh, this sort of elastic condition that I'm describing where space is used for unimagined uses in a sense through that cultural intelligence uh, and that kind of synthesis uh, of different uses uh, uh, playing themselves out in space. And it's a perfect example of the dissolution uh, of this binary, which would otherwise you know, fall into the public-private or use patterns, uh, etc. This, I think, you could also extend to cultural production. And I think the making of spaces for culture, if one begins to introduce the notion uh, that culture can be produced uh, albeit temporarily, spatially, uh, I think the possibilities become massive. Uh, of course, you have organized festivals, uh, but it also might mean how uh, neighborhood streets get closed off to become venues as public spaces. Of course, a lot of this happens anyway. Similarly, how one could formalize how the informal sector transacts in, through their markets, which are otherwise always deemed illegal uh, and susceptible to evictions. And so we, I think, have to expand our imagination about cities uh, uh, to, to understand them as kinetic entities. Uh, and then an extension of that would be how we begin to introduce the temporal scale, temporal imagination, uh, and the notion of reversibility uh, in our broader uh, thinking about planning, urban design, and again, architecture. I think the pandemic, as a result of COVID-19, uh, is providing us an opportunity to actually think about the city in very interesting ways in the long term, because I think the, the, the most good that will come out of this is if these alterations in our imaginations can leave a trace for the future. The home has suddenly become very valuable. We had reached a point, I think in a terrible way in our globalized world, where with the home two things happened. One was for the rich, for the ones that were privileged. The home became a very transient space. 
Uh, they had multiple homes, uh, or the ones who even had one home were traveling a lot. Uh, the, the home had become a transient space, and all of us who are locked at home now are noticing beautiful things, just even light changing as the way it hits a wall in a space that we had taken so much for granted. The poor were very insecure with their homes, and there were great inequities that played out uh, in, in, in where people dwelled. Uh, and so that, I think, suddenly has become clear to us that it's become the most valuable space, uh, especially through the pandemic. And on the other end of the spectrum, all our collective commons, uh, which are, you know, it's social, all the social infrastructure, the physical infrastructure, and possibly even cultural infrastructure, actually has become quite redundant. We can't go back to our museums, we can't go back to our galleries, and we have these enormous amount of resources uh, translated into architecture that are actually becoming redundant in a sense. And so I think for me, the greatest learning uh, from the pandemic uh, for cities and for people in charge of cities would be pay much more serious attention to the home, create forms of equity through housing, through places where people dwell, but make your infrastructure nimble, make your infrastructure multifunctional. We have for too long in society and in our cities uh, perpetuated the creation of monofunctional infrastructure, whether it's a high school, which is only a high school, or it's a flyover, which is just a flyover built in concrete and steel. How do these dissolve into the fabric of our cities? How do they become more than monofunctional pieces of infrastructure which lie empty. Now they're lying empty for months in the pandemic, but even in the, in the old normal, they lay empty for 12 hours of the day. If they were designed differently, they could play other purposes. Schools and high schools could be designed as concert halls, which could be transformed, which could be reversed in terms of functions. Uh, we, could, we could be using open space in good weather for kind of temporary construction uh, of, of, of infrastructure which serves a particular purpose. I always use the example of the Olympics, uh, which is such a waste. Uh, it, it's so much hype uh, that is sort of developed around the Olympics where massive infrastructure is built and often abandoned because there is no capacity or demand within the place where it is located for its use in the future. Couldn't uh, the Olympics be uh, like the old traveling circuses, uh, which went from venue to venue reusing material? And I think the last Olympics that were held in London uh, were a wonderful experiment of how uh, that infrastructure could not only shrink physically, but then actually dissolve into the fabric of what was now a new community that emerged from that piece of infrastructure. So this sort of idea of infrastructure being always embodied in, 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 in some kind of physical construct is a mindset we've got to get out of. Infrastructure, first of all, has to be greatly nuanced. We have to look at physical, social, and cultural infrastructure. And then within that definition or that more nuanced definition of infrastructure, uh, we would have degrees by which we need to embody uh, the, the kind of uh, aspirations or requirements of that infrastructure in actually buildings uh, and is hard infrastructure. A lot of it could be soft infrastructure, infrastructure that touches the ground lightly, that's reversible, uh, and that more, more, more than anything else can actually dissolve into the lived fabric of cities, both the hard city and the soft city. And I think that dissolution is what I sort of call the kinetic city. In our cities, it's an illusion when we think that the buildings are the permanent kind of uh, component of the city, because sometimes you see 200-year-old buildings. But when you dig deeper into many of our cities, you realize the governance systems of our cities are the ones that have been there longer than the buildings, and the ones that are even harder to change, whether it's the system of the mayor or you know, it's other forms of municipalities, 
etc. And what this tells you is that they are not nimble because they become very bureaucratic, uh, they become static. Actually, they're the ones who need to be kinetic, need to be nimble. And that's why our cities aren't prepared for the kind of disasters that we are seeing more and more occur uh, and, and influence our cities, whether they're in flux in terms of demographies and migrants, whether it's flooding, uh, whether it's all the kind of effects of climate change, because our governance systems are not nimble. And so this sort of made us realize that the notion of temporality, the notion of this sort of elasticity uh, within a system as I kind of, I, as I use as attributes of the kinetic city idea, governance is a critical part of this too. And so this notion of elasticity and temporality and reversibility, it's not just about the physical plant of how buildings can be re reused. It's not just about how open space can be reused, how zoning can allow multiplicity of use, how we can break away from monofunctional infrastructure, but it's also about just how cities are managed uh, and how they can become more nimble, which means we might have a series of scenarios in our governance systems which might change the power equations, albeit temporarily, to respond to particular conditions. And that would, I think, really truly give you a kind of urbanism and a kind of city uh, which is not only dynamic, uh, but one which is producing its own culture, albeit culture of governance or go culture of interaction, uh, and constructing and reconstructing uh, this continuously. In the future, if we think of cities, I think for me, uh, there are two or three things that sort of come to mind. And one is just the notion of the size of a city. You know, in the 80s when I was studying urban design, I was taught there's nothing like a city that's too big uh, because you can make it all efficient uh, and big cities have a critical mass and therefore they become markets and, you know. And I think, I, I don't know, I'm beginning to reflect on that 30 years later, not only in the context of the pandemic, but also in the context of uh, us all now reflecting back on uh, what globalization through the perpetuation of neoliberalism, the role of the state, uh, uh, teaches us about how we should look at cities. And I think cities do have an upper limit. And I think in the future, uh, cities will be more about a network ecology of many towns and cities uh, that, that work as an uh, interconnected, interdependent organism, uh, rather than cities that just become big megacities in themselves. Uh, and I think, I think we are at a point uh, as society on this planet uh, that we have to actually uh, confront the notion of what is the right size of us as a society to live together productively and again uh, to be happy. I think what another generation is making a plea for is explain the world to us in a more nuanced way. Equip us to look at the world through different lenses. Lenses metaphorically, but also literally uh, that draw light and an understanding of what you see to your mind, help you recircuit your mind to create those moments of empathy, to create those moments of being able to engage with pluralism and diversity, uh, and to be able to engage with our new world uh, in, in many more productive ways.